much for joining us today and uh, welcome. Um, so this is a Siena webinar on uh, the proposal to develop and, and now the development of ethical guidelines for human enhancement. Uh, my name is Yasmin and I'm a philosopher of language by training, but I've spent the past 12 years in interdisciplinary topics in science and tech. Uh, I was a senior lecturer in philosophy at St. Mary's University in Twickenham until recently, and then I joined the Siena project at the University of Twente in October this year. Um, with me is Eliana Bergamin, who is a master's student on the Philosophy of Science, Technology and Society course at the University of Twente, and she also works with me in the Human Enhancement stream of Siena. So we'll both be talking to you today um, about this topic. Um, I've mentioned Siena already, so I shall introduce the project. It's a, a stakeholder-informed um, project looking at the ethics for new technologies, especially those with high socioeconomic and human rights issues. It's funded under the EU's Horizon 2020 programme. And if you want to know more, um, there's a website there that you can um, look through. Um, just to give you an outline for today, um, I am going to keep us to time. Uh, this section is going to last about 25 minutes um, uh, and it's going to cover these topics. So definitions and some clarifications. Um, a couple of case studies. I'm going to present one case study and um, Eliana is going to pre uh, present another. Um, I'll uh, give you um, the first public view of two of our uh, example guidelines um, so you can see what they look like and then we'll have about half an hour for questions and discussion. Okay, so that's the outline. Uh, I'll stop then with some definitions and um, clarification. Um, in particular, I've mentioned already human enhancement, um, but I've not really said what I mean by that. Well, in Siena, it has a very particular meaning. We think about human enhancement as a modification that aims to improve human performance. And I should point out that performance is understood broadly. So it's not just about a person's abilities, but also their um, sort of general uh, way of living or being in the world. Um, so it's a, a little bit more broad than just one's ability to do something. Um, and we think about these enhancements as brought about you know, by science, by tech. And we also clarify that these are interventions either in or on the body. So this is why I asked Eliana to join me today because I will be presenting a, um, an enhancement that's potentially inside the body, whereas Eliana will be presenting one that's on the body. Okay, so the second question to consider is uh, what do we mean by enhancement and how does it relate to um, therapy, to making someone well? Um, so before I started the project, my colleagues in Siena spent a lot of time, research, uh, study, um, consultation, and also surveying um, to, to try to draw a line here. And it remains um, quite a difficult one. Um, to make, because on the one hand, um, it would seem that making someone well, such as removing disease and injury, wouldn't necessarily be the same as enhancing, i.e. adding to or improving someone's ability. But within that, there are lots of normative judgments made about what we mean by key terms, such as what it is to be healthy, what it is to be normal or average. And these are really problematic terms for more reasons than that, of course. Um, who gets to define those terms, disparities in the control, including of how they're applied, come into play. So it is by no means a, a resolved issue. Um, okay, so in Siena, we also uh, offer subdivisions uh, for human enhancement. There are six of them in total. I don't want to spend a lot of time um, repeating the work done by my colleagues but I've listed there the deliverables. So these are the documents produced by the Siena project, which um, explains more about our research um, or the research that was done um, by Siena, the um, definitions that are offered um, and the process by which these categorizations were made. So we have six categories, cognitive enhancement, physical enhancement, affective and emotional enhancement, moral enhancement, cosmetic enhancement and longevity. Um, all of these are detailed in those um, documents, but we're also able to discuss them in the um, section on questions that comes later, should you. So I can bring this slide back up at any time. Okay, so this is where I come in, because in the last piece of research done before I arrived, what seemed clear 
to uh, colleagues in Siena is that th there aren't existing guidelines on human enhancement. There are guidelines where enhancement overlaps with therapy, with treatment, with medical procedures, and so on. Um, and there are some sort of, some, there's some content when it relates to restoration, but again, that's very much treatment related. Um, and our engagement with stakeholders seem to suggest that um, people thought that guidelines were necessary, would be helpful, would be useful, um, but they're quite difficult um, to draw up. And so this is where we take our task. Okay, so if you're wondering, well, okay, but why, why would you need to have guidelines for the development of um, human enhancement? This is where the case studies come in. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is something called a neural prosthesis. Now, uh, a neural prosthesis is, a, is, a, is an implant or um, it could be external to the body and it can do many things depending on how it's been designed. Um, they're sometimes thought of in terms of um, restoring lost function. Uh, for instance, if there is neural damage um, and they can do this by electrically stimulating nerves. And as I say, that's either external or internal. So that's just an overview of what a neural prosthesis is. What we're talking about then is a device or some kind of um, electrical uh, implant in the brain, which is going to engage with your uh, other brain activity. I'm particularly interested in this one. It's called a hippocampal cognitive prosthesis. Now, if you're not already familiar, the hippocampus is a, a part of the brain which helps to form new memories. So it's not about storing memories, it's the process by which information that we receive, input and so on, is then turned into memory that's stored in the brain. Uh, the hippocampal cognitive prosthesis uh, is being designed by a team led by um, Ted Berger and Hansen in the US, uh, and they're looking to uh, develop this prosthesis uh, with a view to restoring the ability to form new long-term memories, um, which typically occurs after there is damage to the hippocampus. So that's the basis for the research. In one of their papers around uh, 2012, when they're talking about this project, they talk about the potential for enhancement. And this is where my interest peaks because it's not then just about restoring lost function, but actually, quote unquote, improving hippocampal function, for instance, by increasing memory capacity. So at this point, I was working also, and I still do work in AI, um, and um, we, my colleagues and I run a symposium in an AI conference on computing and philosophy. And so we invited the lead, um, um, one of the lead authors for this project over to give a talk about this prosthetic. Um, and as you can see in this agenda from um, that conference, I gave a talk soon after. In response to the project, I asked a number of questions. So, so you know, for instance, what is the primary purpose? Is the purpose for repair or enhancement? And um, what effect could there be on human identity, on human ideals and values and so on, broadly defined? I mean, I'm a philosopher by training, as I said, so these are complex terms. But also more pragmatically, more practically, what does it mean to say that a memory is improved? Are we talking about the accuracy of the memory or the volume of, of memories that could be stored or how complete those memories are? And what, if any, capacity would there be for choice? Um, memories are a very complex part of human identity. And it's not simply the case that we experience things and then those things are stored as memories. There's a lot of um, judgment decisions and so on being made by the brain. Some of that's, a lot of that's unconscious, but some of it is also conscious. It's very complicated. So I think these are important questions to ask. At the time of the um, conference, um, Ted agreed that these are important questions. He said these are not easy questions to answer and that the project didn't necessarily have easy answers to give. Uh, nevertheless, six years later, they're now at the point of what they're describing as successful implementation in humans of a proof of concept system for restoring, and here's the keyword, improving memory function via um, memory encoding. Um, I should clarify that this um, uh, study from 2018 is actually um, using um, the, the hippocampal replacement as external to the body. And the reason they could do this is because they used patients who have epilepsy um, who already have neural implants 
Um, so those implants are electrodes implanted in the hippocampi in order to monitor for seizure related electrical activity. So they were able to, um, to tap into that system so as to test how um, their own technology could help to um, improve memory encoding. What's interesting is how this is reported um, and what people think this might do, um, uh, including, for example, this is, um, this is a, a description of the study in Wired, a popular science and tech um, online uh, newsletter or, or a website, um, which talks about brain boosting. So it's not simply restoration that we're talking about. Oh. That's dropped my face, um, but also the possibility to improve. Um, and this is a section from that uh, article where, you know, so the first quote there is from Rob Malenka, who's a psychiatrist, not affiliated with the project, still um, quoted as saying, well, it will be decades before this kind of approach will ever be used routinely. Fine. But also worth noting are the kinds of people interested in this sorts of technology. So we have people like Facebook working on brain computer in interfaces, people like Elon Musk being cited. Um, and that's when in Siena we start to have some concerns because of course, once technology finds its way into the, um, into the sector, into industry, it might be more difficult or it can be more difficult to, to encourage ethical um, consideration. Okay, so that's that case study, um, a prosthetic that can be worn into the, in the body and which could have enhancement um, potential. Uh, Eliana, I'm happy to pass over to you for the next yeah, thanks one. Thanks so much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much, especially for this occasion. And so today I'm going to discuss the Aura Ring technology, uh, some of its unintended consequences and how ethical guidelines can help avoiding these kind of consequences. So the Aura Ring is a sleep tracking device that was developed first in 2013. Uh, it is um, a device that you wear on your finger in the shape of a ring uh, that has some sensors that does send some um, insights into the app that's paired uh, on your phone via Bluetooth. And the goal of this device is the one of optimizing your perfect amount of sleep, your perfect amount of rest in uh, overall achieved self-optimization. So in this case, for example, you can like receive notifications such as now it's time to rest or it's time to go to bed, put your phone away. What I thought was very interesting because I started looking into the Aura Ring in early 2019. Uh, but then in 2020, they, in, they introduced this new feature, which is the rest mode, which is aimed at detecting stress and reducing pressure in the user. Uh, what I thought was problematic uh, when looking into this device is some of the consequences that it can entail, such as orthosomnia. So orthosomnia is a medical condition that's been studied uh, now like for five years, so starting 2015, 2014, a little bit. It's basically the condition that when patients become so preoccupied with achieving the perfect amount of sleep, then they care more about that perfect amount of data than the sleep itself. So they lay in bed and they try so much to fall asleep because they know they need to achieve that amount of data and they cannot fall asleep because of that anxiety. So first of all, why would we need a, a rest mode in a device or an app that's specifically designed to make you rest or make you sleep? Why would you need a, a further improvement in that? And what um, it, it's been proven that, uh, for example, through a study published in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine in 2016, that patients tend to adopt unhealthy sleep habits when using sleep trackers, such as, for instance, the Aura Ring or the Fitbit. For instance, one patient told uh, the doctor that he was feeling pressure to achieve the perfect amount of sleep while laying in bed. Another patient, after starting using sleep tracking devices, he became concerned about periods of restless sleep in the bed, so becoming so anxious about it, they could not fall asleep. And one of the most interesting insights is that another patient, after a poly polysomnogram um, test in the hospital with doctors, and the, ho the doctors told her, You're, you had like a deep sleep phase, your sleep was perfectly fine. Then she answered, yeah, but why then my Fitbit tells me that I haven't. So they, tr they tend to trust more the device itself than medical uh, doctors um, like in person. Um, so what is interesting and important to remind is like um, wearable sleep trackers 
don't actually discriminate between stages of sleep and between wake and sleep. So uh, why do um, patients tend to try more, tend to trust more devices that have these kind of inaccuracies compared to medical um, and doctors? So what human enhancement guidelines can help help in this is they can reduce the risk of unintended consequences, both in the physical and psychological health side, um, especially because, uh, as Yasmin already mentioned, it's harder to track these kind of consequences Why, once the technology has been put out in the industry, in the market. So there, there is a need to evaluate them beforehand. So before they're introduced in the market, maybe complementing regulations or especially with uh, devices that tend to, um, can be used without medical consultation, which is the case, for example, for the Fitbit or for uh, the Aura Ring itself. So I believe that human enhancement guidelines are necessary in this kind of um, um, cases. And yeah, this has been my mm, presentation and I'll pass it back to Yasmin who will discuss some of the ethical guidelines. That's wonderful, thank you, Eliana. Okay, so those are our two case studies. And as I said, I'm going to now introduce you to some of the, the guidelines. I've picked two in particular. Um, before I do, just to clarify, what we're talking about then is the development of ethical guidelines for research, development, and application of human enhancement technologies and procedures. Now, this is quite a broad category, but um, we think it's important to try and um, tackle how uh, uh, human enhancement finds its way in, into, um, into use uh, in all of these stages. Um, I also want to, to point out, of course, that the lines between research and development aren't always clear. So, you know, what counts as research, what counts as development is tricky to, to, to distinguish. Um, and that's part of why we, we try to include both. As I've already said, the foundations for the guidelines can be found in the research already produced by Siena, uh, including in these streams. Um, I also want to point out that the guidelines, as we're developing them, have been informed by stakeholder engagement. This includes with experts in human enhancement, uh, ethicists, policymakers, industry, and so on and so on. Um, and the important detail is that the next stage for these guidelines will be public consultation. So that's part of why we're having the webinar today to launch that process, to encourage you to participate in that pro process. Um, the best way to do that would be, if you haven't already, to it, it would be to subscribe to the CNN newsletter um, because then we will let you know exactly when the um, public consultation process will open. It will be in January. It's going to be for a short period of time. It will be just for a couple of weeks. So it really is quite important to, you know, stay on top of when that when that will open to, to sign up so that you don't miss it. Okay, so that's a little bit more background. Now I've picked two guidelines, as I say, work in progress. These are these are draft guidelines that I think that um, apply to both of the technologies that we've considered today. Um, so I won't read all of this aloud to you, but I will draw your attention to two particular um, elements at the very end. Uh, and this is how we take into account the well-being of a recipient of an enhancement. OK, um, it requires or we suggest it requires a careful weighing of potential benefits and harm. And this means taking into account an extended period of time, their unique characteristics, their particular circumstances, as well as their own perspectives and wishes, as well as any potential changes in their circumstances and life choices over time. So um, it's very clear that um, the unintended consequences from the technology that Eliana has described um, could impact on a person's well-being. And it's also clear that um, the use of a prosthesis such as um, a hip, an artificial hippocampus could also um, impact on someone's well-being if, for example, it removes the, or, or makes more difficult um, the chance for the person to have any conscious interaction with the memories that are stored. So that's the first guideline. And as I say, I'm happy to come back to all of the detail in the next section, uh, for, which is discussion, which will start very soon. But first, I'll introduce you to the second guideline, 
Um, and this concerns the personality of an individual. Now, this is a difficult one to um, finesse because, of course, we have to ask a question, what do we mean by personality and how much control does someone have over their personality and so on? But what we take as a given is that someone has some uh, control, some say, some autonomy uh, when it comes to their personality and or identity. Um, and so what we're suggesting is that guidelines should be excluded if they um, uh, affect someone's personality in a way that distorts or limits that potential for control. Um, again, it's not easy to, to, to say how much is in someone's control, but our concern is that um, human enhancement technology shouldn't limit those beyond what someone already has. Um, of particular interest for the hippocampal example is the um, point we make about the identity of a person, what we describe here as a self that persists in time as located in one person and as affecting their potential to live authentically. And this is all tied up not only with their beliefs and desires, but also their memories. Um, so that's the second guideline. Um, at this stage, so in, nicely in time, what I would like to do is to thank you for listening. It, we've given you quite a lot of content, quite a lot of information, um, and to invite your questions. Um, and I imagine you'll want to, um, so for me to go back to, to those two guidelines so that we can inspect them in more detail. Um, but at this point, I'm happy to thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.